If you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to open it with me back up to Judges chapter 3. And, and uh, I want you to know that um, I greatly appreciate Galen. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce some of those words. I'm going to tell you that in advance. I told them in the early service that it wasn't going to happen. And it didn't. So, um, so understand, we, we serve an awesome and mighty God who, who clearly communicated with us. But, you know, some, some names are harder than others. And, um, and I'm here to tell you, there, th- these passages today, no shortage of that. So we live in a society, we're talking about faithfulness of God, and we're talking about the judges. And, and, and sometimes we think, how in the world could the judges mean anything to me? I mean, we're talking the age of iron chariots was modern technology. This can't mean anything to me. I live in a world where I've got my iPhone on my, on my wrist, and I don't have one of those, but I'm just saying, some of y'all do. We live in a day and age where hearing aids are connected to your, your cell phones. For those of you that are at that point, they, they do everything nowadays, okay? Um, we live where we can talk to anyone anywhere in the world at any given time. I want you to understand, though, that there was an attitude of casual faith among the children of Israel. Not unlike today. Because too many people, they look at their walk with God as a casual relationship. As no big deal. I can pick and choose to serve God when it's convenient for me, when it's easy for me, when I feel up to it. My pleasure, my desires, they rate much higher. They rate much higher than a devoted life to the living God. Because I'm going to tell you something, though, folks. I'm going to tell you. If you are practicing casual Christianity, then you are lukewarm. And I, I dare you to Google what, don't do it right now, you got phones, okay? But I dare you, Google up what Jesus thinks of lukewarm Christianity. Oh, I'll just tell you, it's Revelation 3.16. He says, I'd just rather spew you, out of your mouth, spew you out of my mouth, vomit. He doesn't think much of lukewarm faith. Rather be cold than lukewarm. Folks, the people, the children of Israel, hey, it's God's word, I can't help that. His picture is not mine. I'm going to tell you something. You're either all in or you're not. And that is what God is trying to say. So the children of Israel, what happened? We pick up in chapter 3, and they've got this attitude. Verse 4, we see that they were, they, were, they were for testing Israel to find out if they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which He had commanded their fathers through Moses, which were, go into the land, Kick them out. Do it the way I told you. Do not marry with them. Do do not intermarry. Do not make covenants. Do not make deals and contracts. Don't work with them. This is one of those times you're going to clean house and you're going to push them right out because thus saith the Lord. And folks, if you ever have a problem with what God has done in the Old Testament and you're dealing with some of your friends who are like, oh, that God was so tough. Listen, if God's judgment is not perfect and complete, then He couldn't have saved you in the first place. Okay? Okay? It means even when we don't understand everything in Scripture, when God judges a people, that's, it is perfect and true. You can trust Him. Because otherwise, you couldn't trust, trust the faith that you have this day. But I digress. That's more than I plan on giving you. Listen, he, this idea that they were sent and they were being tested because they weren't following through on all that God had commanded. Well, maybe God doesn't care if we do this. Maybe it's not really a big deal at all. Verse 5, it says, The sons of Israel lived among the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivajiba guys and the, and the Jebusites. I know I'm terrible at pronouncing these, and man, I'm going to tell you, I, I will tell you this. This is going to surprise you. But the way Southern Baptists pronounce some of these name, names in Texas is not the same way they do it in Mississippi or Georgia, or Florida, or anywhere else. We kind of guess. All right? Just telling you. But the long and the short of it, so there's all these people that they're living among that they're not necessarily supposed to, but they didn't just live among them. Verse 6, it says, And they took their daughters, and for themselves as wives, and, and gave their daughters and their sons, and served their gods. You see, it's no big deal. Go marry them. It's, it's not a big deal. 
You know, so you watch a movie that dis, 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 dishonors the name of Jesus. No big deal. So you watch, so you condone a friend who's living, living in open, blatant sin and just say, hey, it's no big deal. Do what you want. How are you living your life? Because see, it, it starts with little compromises. And in their case, they went all in. You see, see, we've been called to live in the world, but not of the world. We're supposed to be living and being salt and light in the darkness to bring the love of Jesus to the masses through God's faith. And, and here they are, supposed to be the lights of God, a, a royal priesthood, if you will, the, the whole nation to draw people to Yahweh, not to become like everybody else. And what they do? They went in and they started marrying people. We say it's okay. Oh, well, just marry who you want. If you love them, it's good. Heard that in a Luke Bryant song or something like that. I'm going to tell you something. You don't marry just who you In one of my former churches, I had a young lady, and she was a member. Everybody's an active member, so everybody's in good standing. That's the problem with Baptist churches, so don't worry. <laughs> but she decided to get married. She married a man who was a Muslim. Southern Baptist with a Muslim. Doesn't the Bible say something about not being unequally yoked with someone of another faith? I'm going to tell you something, folks. It's hard, and I do mean this, it's hard to have a good relationship. It is hard to have a good relationship with a spouse and you both come from the same Southern Baptist roots. Thank you. Okay? And it's even harder with people who are of the same faith, meaning Catholic and Baptist, trying to figure out how they're going to raise their kids and figure out what that's going to look like. Because some, let, me, let me let you on a little secret. Somebody can say, I'm irreligious, and that's what they say. They'll say, oh, I'm irreligious. It don't matter, honey. Whatever you want, I love you. You're just so pretty. Or then the other way. But you, just as soon as that first baby shows up, and it's time to decide how that child will be raised, suddenly we all reach back to our roots. Suddenly faith matters. And I'm going to tell you something, if you're marrying someone who believes differently than you, especially if they, and I'm not talking within denominations of Catholic and Baptist, I'm talking about between a Muslim and a, and a Christian of any type. Do you understand the problems that that's going to cause? I mean, just get down to the way girls are treated and we'll just leave that at that. We compromise things and say it's going to be okay. It's no big deal. Folks, it is a big deal. It is a big deal because when we start letting them have a little bit they'll take a mile what happened is is with these marriages what's what's taking place is when they give in marriage and take in marriage these are you remember when you took your european history and you started learning about the royals and and how how king henry would send his well he didn't have very many kids but then but these kings would send out their daughters to marry other kings and their sons would marry the daughters of other kings and all of that stuff Right? Come on, give me a head shake. Were they doing it because they were in love? No, they were doing it to build alliances, to build covenants, to build contracts. That's what's taking place. What did God tell them not to do? Don't have any covenants with this people. And he's doing it. And, and bringing evil. But they didn't go there they, because God knew what would happen is it, was, it would begin to cause them to serve their gods. But it's no big deal. It's no big deal as long as I'm sober most of the time, but I can get drunk when I feel like it from time to time and go party with my friends. It's no big deal if I use bad language as long as the preacher's not present. It's no big deal. It's no big deal if we don't faithfully attend and serve God in church with our fellow believers. It's no big deal. It's no big deal when baseball, football, soccer, and any other sport becomes more important than the faithful service and worship of the living God. But folks, I have to tell you something. It is a big deal. Verse 7, it says, The sons of Israel did not, did, did what was evil in the sight of God, the sight of the Lord. For, and they forgot the Lord, their God, and, and served the Baals and the Asherah. It is a big deal. Sin is always a big deal. Evil is a huge deal to the living God. You see verse 8, it says, And then the anger of the Lord kindled against Israel. 
And it goes on to tell how he punished him by this king of Mesopotamia who's really bad. And, and just so you know, that cushion, I have no idea what that means, but that second part that nobody can pronounce, I'm going to tell you now that means he was double evil. Okay? It was, he was exceedingly evil. And God disciplined them for eight years. You see, sin is always a big deal to God. Sin is always a big deal to God. Yes, God is love. Yes, God is full of mercy and compassion. But God is also just in his very nature. He is just. He is holy. He is righteous. And all sin must be punished, atoned for. Even gossip, lust, Jealousy. Oh, that's Old Testament, Larry. Jesus is love. Man, I'm going to tell you something. Jesus had harsh words to say to those who, who blatantly disrespected and dishonored God, who weren't all in. But when we talk about how big a deal sin is to God, He allowed His one and only Son to die on behalf, to die in place. of all who would believe in him. The precious blood of Jesus was shed. Sin's no big deal. Oh, it's a big deal. It's a very big deal. So these people, they, they took it too easy. They took a laissez-faire mentality. And so God punished them because he loves his children when he got angry. He didn't kill them, but he handed them over to this other king who was exceedingly wicked. And, and it says, and, and then after eight years, he, they were under his, under his hand for eight years. They were punished. They were disciplined for eight straight years. And for some of you, you're sitting there thinking, yep, that's what it is when a president wins two terms in office. Regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, if you like this one, you didn't like that one, Every party's had somebody in there for at least eight years at some point, right? And, 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 and if you're on the other side of the aisle, all you can think is, is, Lord, this punishment will never end. Would you shut them up? But that's another subject for another day. This guy was worse than your worst fear in the presidency. Why? Because he was a king. Why? Because he had an army. He could do such damage to the people and abuse them in ways that regardless of what your political disposition is, their worst day couldn't even come close to what this king could do. It wasn't good. It was hard. No big deal, though. Sin doesn't matter. See, sin, sin always has consequences. Even though Jesus forgives, <laughs> the reality is sin always has consequences. And when is it a big deal? Big deal is when we get caught or we're suffering the consequences of our sins. What happens in the passage? Pick up with me. I think we're in verse 9. And when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord. So now it's a big deal. So now you want to come and ask for some help. You didn't want my help when you were marrying into these other faiths. You didn't want my help when you were going to the fertility gods and doing those crazy things that you should not be doing. Now it's good. Now it matters to you. You know, this is usually what happens with parents who have children in, in the school system is, is it's no big deal. They can do whatever. It's no big deal. Until, sometime, until, until suddenly there's a change in your child. But the problem is, parents... The change in your child, by the time you see it in your child, it's usually too late. And if you don't see it while they're in your house, you will for sure enough see it when they're full grown. So what do you do? Well, God is gracious. He's merciful. He loves His people. And when they cried out, He sent a deliverer. He, it says, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's Caleb's younger brother, listen, and you got to ask yourself a question. Who in the world is qualified at this point amongst children of Israel? 
Who in the world has been faithful at this point serving the living God? Well, I'm glad you asked. Move over. To, in my Bible, it's just one page. Go back over to chapter one. And y'all probably noticed last week we kind of skipped over this section. Love to hear those pages turn. You see, you see, you see, Othmel was being faithfully prepared. He was faithfully prepared from an early time. He stands in opposition and contrast to those other people in the children, the other children of Israel. In that they were intermarriage, they were giving their children off in intermarriage. They were going forth in these things and they were worshiping things that they should not. But I've not. Verse 11, we pick up and then we see that, see that um, for from then they went up against the inhabitants of Derbyr or, or whatever it's going. And, and Caleb said to, to all of them, and he says, he says to his men, he says to the, to the men in, in his uh, tribe and he was part of Judah, Caleb says to him, he says, the one who attacks, same name, same place, and captures it, get this, get this right here. I will even give him my daughter for a wife. Now, before you, I, I know some of you, some of you have looked and it says it's Caleb's brother. Are, are you saying that they were, I, I know some of you are thinking a little bit of Arkansas feel right now. And if you're from Arkansas, I'm sorry. Okay. Because, you know, it's his brother, you know, it's marrying his niece. Kind of fruit from Arkansas, I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> Here's what happens. Caleb probably only had daughters. And and when he gave his wife, he accepted and, and he was a part of the larger family. He may have been may have been Othnel's uncle, may have been um, may have been uncle nephew. It was it was close, but it wasn't too close. Uh, but the idea was when when he took over, when he took over when he married his daughter because he had no male descendants, he claimed Othniel as a brother. That's part of the picture that we don't necessarily pick up. And there's some other passages that we've got there, but that's, that's neither here nor there. We see that Othniel, when he's offered up a great woman, a great possibility, he puts his desires on there. He is going to take responsibility for his faith. He's going to take responsibility. He's going to take the initiative for a positive spiritual outcome. This is what we're going to see here. Look, he wasn't running around desiring the Canaanite women. Okay, they might have been pretty ladies, but he wasn't running around desiring them. Folks, do you realize that what we set our desires on isn't necessarily what we're supposed to have? I'm going to tell you, I love country music. All right? But I also like rap. I also like heavy metal. I'm, I'm weird. Okay, I admit it. But you know my problem with country music is right now? And I know it's bro country, and you can make fun of me, but I listen to 70s country too, and outlaw country was just as bad as bro country when it comes to drinking, partying, and chasing women. Am I wrong? Anybody tell me I'm wrong. I don't mind if you tell me I'm wrong. Can I tell you something? The more you put that kind of stuff in your head, the more likely you're, you're likely to look at someone you're not supposed to. The more likely you're begin, you will begin to desire things that you should not desire. Hey, listen, if you watch bad movies with graphic, graphic scenes in it, you may desire to do some of those things. And can I tell you something? Desire in nowhere in Scripture. Let me, let me, let me make this absolutely clear. Desire, good or bad, is something that can be changed. You weren't born with that desire. You're not stuck with that desire because God can change your want-tos. God can change your desires. When we faithfully prepare to serve the living God, when we faithfully prepare to be blessed by God, when we take the initiative to live out godly lives, we make sure that our desires are in line with God's. Now, how do I do that, preacher? By what? Studying God's Word. By spending time in prayer. Listen, if you've got a bad desire, like you like Baylor, for instance, God can pray that out of you. <laughs> it's either that or A&M. I just couldn't make up my mind. I feel bad for y'all after that whooping yesterday. Moral victory. It'd be the longest football game of all time. 
and then some. Um, anyway, um, <coughs> folks, we can pray and seek God to change our desires to where we need to be. You see, for Othniel, from the beginning, it was all about having an Israelite wife, one of same faith, one that was equally yoked to him. And I want you to let you know oh, a little secret there, guys. When we seek God's desires for our lives, I guarantee you, you're going to outkick your coverage with the lady that you're married to. Okay, that's a football reference. You're going to marry way above yourself. Okay, so look at your wife and smile and say, yeah, I did. I married above myself. This will help you out for later. Okay, just trust me. Okay, he, his desires lined up with God's desires for his people. To marry within like faith. To marry like faith. And, and you want to talk about a good woman? Let me, let me tell you. Oh, let me see where I can find it. All right, so verse 13, he, he went forth and he captured it and he received her as his wife. And then verse 14, and then it came about, then it came about that she, she came to him and, and, and she persuaded him to ask her father, for a field. And in that field, in that field that, that they wanted, and, and it come around that, that there was a spring, there was a water source. They were going to go down to Negev, 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 Negev. And, and it was a very dry area, and they needed a piece of land in addition that would have water. And you see, because his intent, he, he took responsibility for his faith, and he tried to honor God in his decision-making and in the way he married. He also received a woman that was wise, and he was wise enough to listen to his wife. Because I'm going to tell you something. My wife keeps me from making all kinds of stupid decisions. And if it hadn't happened, I don't know. And I'm pretty sure, and I'm sorry, I've got to do this in the modern day. I'm pretty sure, ladies, your husbands have helped you from making some foolish decisions as well. Because that's why God puts us together. That's why God puts us together because we need to take the initiative to do godly things. And having a God-honoring marriage will make a great difference. And some of you are sitting here right now and you're saying, well, wait a minute, preacher. I'm widowed. I'm divorced. I, I'm not married right now. I'm single. What does this have to do with me? Can I tell you, when you set your desires upon God to prepare your life, you... Put around yourself fellow Christian believers. Not, not just anybody. I, hey, listen, if you've got a bunch of casual Christian friends, they're not the people you go to for Christian wisdom. You want to go find devoted, mature Christians and talk with them about your issues. Talk, about, talk to them about your struggles. Othnel was faithfully prepared because he spent his time, he spent his life doing what God would have him to do. Spent that direction in total. In fact, I've got a feeling, I've got a feeling that Othniel, Othniel was one of those people. When at the end of, 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 of Joshua 24, it, it says that, that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Do you want to quit being a casual Christian and being a casual Christian family? Start right here. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. All of Israel said that, but most of them didn't mean it. And I'm going to tell you something. When you make a promise to God, you better keep it. Because it is a big deal. You want to know why the divorce rate is so high? Because a bunch of people made a promise before God and to somebody else and did not intend to keep it. Because divorce is no big deal in our society. Folks, I want you to know it's a huge deal. <coughs> Listen, he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And how does that start to work out? Because your kids are going to know. Your kids are going to see. Your friends are going to see how you mean this. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're faithfully prepared, if you've taken the initiative, you've taken the initiative for a positive spiritual outcome, if you've taken the initiative in this area, one of those things that we're going to see is faithful service to God in the church. But we're going to see faithful church attendance. We're going to see faithful Sunday school attention. We're going to see you in Bible studies. We're going to see you 
a part of service projects. I'll, I'll put it this way, and it may have just got out there this morning. Our men's and women's ministry are about to run down, run up to uh, Mission Arlington in a couple of weeks, and they're going to do some service. I've got one couple signed up. Did y'all put it out this morning? Yeah, so it ain't been out there very long, but there's an opportunity. We're going to see it in your actions. We're going to see it start to take place. Do you want to be spiritually prepared? Do you want to be thankfully prepared for service that God has for you? Remember, Israel was in a mess. Israel was in a quandary. Israel was struggling. And who was faithful? The one person who had been faithfully preparing for God's service. You know, some people in this room, you've been Baptist a long time, maybe Methodist, maybe something else doesn't matter, but you've gone to every Bible study. You've done Experiencing God by Henry Black will be three times. You have read every John MacArthur book there is. You even do John Piper just for extra, okay? We know how it works. You watch, you, you make sure that you get good preaching every Sunday morning because you turn on First Dallas on your way to church. I like Robert. Uh, Robert's a good guy. Listen, but I'm going to tell you something. There's a whole bunch of believers who are faithfully prepared that aren't stepping up to faithfully serve. So let's go back to chapter three, chapter three. Now, one little thing that I did skip over and I realized I did it. You notice that Othniel was son of Kenaz and, and he was a kin, I can't say the word, but he was from another tribe that was not of Israel. In other words, they had been grafted in. And how did he become part of the family? By faith. He faithfully believed in, in the God of Israel, Yahweh. He faithfully believed their whole family, the ones who set it up, Caleb and his family set it up for this day in which he would show his faith to be true so that God could use him. So we go back and we see that, that, that faith that grafted him, that, that brought him to it. So he's a believer. So he's been faithfully prepared. You see, we need to understand something. We'll be in verse 10, chapter 3, verse 10. We need to understand something. When God calls us to serve, when God calls us to serve, we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry. He's got this in his hand. He has this handled. Notice what it says, verse 10. It says, the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel and he went out to war and the Lord gave him the king of Mesopotamia, into his hand so that he prevailed over him. He prevailed over this exceedingly wicked person. He had been faithfully preparing for this opportunity forever. I hear people all the time saying, I wish God would use me to do something great as long as it's this, this, or this. But not any of that stuff over there. I'm going to tell you something. When God comes up and you're faithfully prepared and he taps you on the shoulder, It's not time for a discussion. It's not time for a debate. In that moment, you have a decision to make, and it should be a one-word answer. Books calls a faithfully devoted life to Christ. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, it means you're going to respond with one word. Yes. You want to add Lord there? It works too. Yes, Lord. I ask people all the time. I ask people all the time who are clearly gifted, are clearly talented. They are clearly faithfully prepared, or at least it looks that way. Would you consider serving in this ministry, serving in this capacity? Would you consider doing this or that. The ones that scare me the most are the ones that instantly say, no. I mean, they're fast. They make the Lone Ranger look like he was slow. No. Not glad you asked. And sadly, because so many people that are faithfully prepared and they're able to do and accomplish the job say, no. There's the other side that happens. Some of you can't say no. You say yes. Because you know the need is great. And you know the need is there, so you do it anyway. 
You realize there's only one thing I ask you to do? When a committee asks, when a team leader asks, when a Sunday school asks, when, when somebody in the church asks you to serve, we just want you to prayerfully consider it. All you got to do, if you're not sure, you're caught off guard, all you got to do is say, in the quiet, Lord, what do you want me to do? If you say yes, I'm, I'm there. If you say no, I'll tell them no. That's all I'm looking for. For you to look me in the eye or look whoever it is in the eye and say, God said no. But you know, the scary thing about that is, is you're speaking for God, Right? If you're faithfully prepared, you know what God is telling you because you're comfortable with hearing the voice of God instruct you in your path each day. But too many of us, when God taps, we make excuses, we run away. And the passage says about Othnel, it says the, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. Here was this one who was not a, a born, meaning an ethnic Jew. He was one that was an outsider. And yet when God laid his hand upon him, he was able to accomplish what God called him to do. Not for just a moment, but for 40 years until he died. Verse 11, then the land had rest for 40 years. We see it right here until he passed away because he was faithfully prepared. He maintained his preparedness and he trusted in the spirit of the Lord. Because can I tell you something? God, God can, come, can accomplish anything He wants to. But I promise you this, it will not contradict the Word of God. It won't contradict His Word, so don't worry. So if you're scared of people, you're scared of what people will say, you're scared because the task is hard, okay, I get that. That's reasonable. But you see, it's okay to be afraid as long as that fear doesn't paralyze you. As long as that fear doesn't prevent you from saying yes to the living God in His service. To faithfully serve Him. You see, when we are faithfully prepared, when we are willing, when we, we are willing to do what God tells us to do, God will use the faithful to deliver the unfaithful. We have a job. We have a purpose. We have a mission. I ask you this morning, if you were honestly to take an account of your walk with God right now in this moment, I'm not talking about when you were 16 years old and you received Jesus in your Lord and Savior and you were in the youth band and you, you knocked on doors. I'm not talking about your faith 20 years ago. I'm not talking about a past faith. I'm talking about a current faith. I ask you this question. I can't judge it, but you know. <coughs> Is faith a big deal or not? not. Because if faith is a big deal to you, it will show in a Jesus first lifestyle. When you do all the evaluations and you do all the math, Is Jesus Lord of your life? Because there's a good chance that if you realize you've been practicing casual Christianity, meaning it's no big deal, I'll help sometimes, and you hadn't helped in a long time, you hadn't served in a long time, there is a good chance this morning that while Jesus was once Lord, the new Lord is yourself. Today during our time of response, I 
I offer you something simple. We have a faithful God who is faithful to can forgive our sins when we confess them and repent of them. The altar is open if you'd like to spend time here. Because sometimes it is necessary to kneel before Him to make sure that we understand our place is kneeling before our Lord. Because the Bible says every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Someone here today doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Today we will offer you an invitation to receive His gift today of eternal life. Just come on down and we'll share with you from God's Word what you need to know. But for to the rest of you, are you faithfully prepared to serve God? And that includes saying yes.